I want to now turn this over to Jim and Ellington West. Um, Jim is a past president of the ASA, um, is a gold medal recipient of the society, um, has been inspiration for so many, um, started his career at Bell Labs, um, is now on the faculty at Johns Hopkins University, um, is working with uh, Ellington um, on a digital stethoscope, which they introduced and discussed um, through a keynote or plenary uh, at Acoustics Virtually Everywhere. Um, he is a pioneer in the field. Um, his daughter has been um, equally impactful um, in her own right in bringing new technologies um, uh, to the communities, um, which I think are really gonna make a huge difference, um, particularly in the medical community. So I asked them to uh, sort of guide, a, uh, have a conversation uh, um, I, I believe Ellington is going to moderate this conversation, um, you know, probably have some initial thoughts, questions, and then we're going to open the floor um, to everyone in the room uh, to just participate in, in this conversation. All right, so please, Ellington and, and Jim, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tyrone. Um, let, let me begin by getting everybody on the same page, um, just in case all of you did not uh, hear the seminar that we gave some months ago. Um, pneumonia takes lives of between a million and a million and a half infants each year. And it's a perfectly curable disease. So what's the problem? The problem is in detection. The fact that you need a trained person to use a stethoscope in a quiet environment, which is hard to find in the third world, uh, to listen to the sounds from the infant's chest to determine if further treatment is necessary. Um, it's not often that a problem and funding come hand in hand. And this one did for, for us because it was funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation through the Bloomberg Public Health uh, Center at Johns Hopkins. Um, so what, we were able to do was to use artificial intelligence to train a mechanical, a, a, an electronic stethoscope to identify the sounds of pneumonia. Now, a lot had to be done in order to, to make that. One of the main things that we had to do was to eliminate noise. So we had to generalize the noise canceling a uh, headphone to be able to keep up with moving targets. Uh, and um, once my students had gotten this device to, to the point that it was really working, I began to worry about the fact that this is wonderful technology. It's not going to save lives. It's going to sit on the shelf. And my daughter Ellington got tired of hearing me say that and quit her job and headed a company and I'll turn it over to her to tell you the rest of the story behind the business then. Thanks so much, Dad. So it's an honor to be here with all of you today. And also, I just want to say how much I appreciate listening to the mission and intention behind inclusion and diversity and acoustics and beyond in how do we also increase um, access in the job market when we're looking at our acousticians, right? Because there's so much opportunity and we see where we need to go. And it's just amazing to hear that this is what's being discussed behind closed doors when it comes to summer programs and other opportunities. Um, so yes, I did uh, jump in. Uh, I quit my job and decided that the best thing to do would be to really teach the world about augmented acoustics in the sense that we're thinking about about how we can use acoustics to make clinical decisions. So we developed a device named Felix. We just received our FDA approval. I've raised about to date only two and a half million and about 2 million in um, NIH grants. And we're gearing up for about a $15 million raise in the next six months. So we have a lot of traction and there is a lot to be said about women and minorities and just really innovative thinkers in acoustics who can transform worlds outside of the conventional expectations, right? So um, 
that's really what what I was able to do. I, I, I pulled in a team, a, an additional former ASA president, Eileen Bush Vishniak serves as our chief uh, technology officer. So when you see the power that comes out of ASA meetings, it is literally at the forefront and face of, of our company. So um, I really think that instead of me taking a deep dive into the technology and what we were able to create at Sanavi, I think it would be really interesting to kind of talk to Jim about his transition from Bell Labs to academia as an acoustician and physicist and what you felt and acknowledged as, as being different in those spaces. And then now that you're part of this startup, what's your perspective there also? So I think that's a lot to unpack. So let's just talk about the transition in perspective from Bell Labs to Hopkins, going from corporate to academia as we kind of think about the road ahead for some of our students and also colleagues. Right, I can sum that up with one word, money. Um, at Bell Labs, funds were readily available for research. Um, it, it was typical to have lunch and on the placemat, which had a nice picture on one side <clears throat> and the other side was uh, clear. And we'd always flip them over because we knew that notes would have to be written or taken. And believe it or not, we have gone from lunch with a new idea to the managers and gotten the funds in order to be able to conduct that research. Well, those of you who are in academia know that that's not the way the system works. You have to have the money up front before you can do the work. So um, going from free money to having to spend half my time raising money was one big uh, hang up. One that I'm still not used to and it's been 20 years. I still quench every year when I have to perform those uh, re responsibilities. Work-wise, things have not changed very much. Um, Hopkins uh, is um, um, among the unique universities and first it's a research institution, but second and more important, there are no stovepipes. And those of you who are in academia know what I mean when I say that. Um, we collaborate across departments and across divisions. And many of us, as a matter of fact, I wouldn't be at all surprised that most of us have something going on with the medical school because that is our biggest motivator and driver. Johns Hopkins Hospital has been number one or number two for the past 15 or 20 years. And if you talk to the president of the hospital, he'll say it's the Whiting School of Engineering that, that put the hospital in the position that it's in. So there is a symbiotic relationship here that works uh, very well for me, at least, and a lot of my colleagues. Thank you. you. You brought up an interesting point when you were talking about the intersection of um, departments and how collaboration is really key in your success. I'm curious if you might be willing to explore what diversity means to you through the lens of collaboration. Um, very interesting uh, question. Um, in the early days, and, and I see one of my colleagues, uh, Bishnu Atal, who uh, was been very much a part of my life at Bell Labs. We even shared an office early in, in our careers. Um, the, the wonderful thing about Bell Labs is that the world was contained in that one organization. There were people from every corner of the world at Bell Labs. So the diversification of the group not only including um, uh, along racial lines, but from country lines, from, from parts of the world, were all sort of put in this mixing pot and mixed together. Um, and it was always very interesting to me that um, there's a difference in the way that I think relative to my peers. And uh, I'm not sure how to, 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 to quantify this. The only thing I can say is by, by example, 
uh, the majority can be over here and I'm over here, but the solution is somewhere in, in the middle, the, the ideal solution is somewhere in the middle. And th this was later, I, I learned later what this is all about, uh, serving on a committee for the National Academies where principals of major companies were invited in to talk about the effects of diversity on their products. And 100% of them felt and, and could demonstrate that they had a better product coming from diverse groups. So diversity counts in a way that I don't think we fully understand yet. I, I don't understand why my thought process might be different from others and why it may agree with people who are of the same race as I am, but may differ if the races are different. Um, I think this is also true as far as um, sex is concerned. Uh, Eileen and I worked together, but we fought a lot as you can, might imagine if you know her at all. Um, but there were always good fights and, and, and we always learned something from each other uh, during those uh, exercises. So, um, uh, Diversity is, is important and, and it really works. It gives you a better solution to technical problems anyway. I completely agree. And, and what's interesting and unique about where we are today is that when I'm looking, like I my view right now is the gallery view and the diversity in what is looking back at me right now is incredible and rare for me on a daily basis in my space. I'm generally the only female and the only person of color. So to have this moment, I'm curious, and, and I'm going to ask this question to Jim, but honestly open it up to the floor. What did it take for us to get here in this moment of having this type of diversity? How do we duplicate that? And, and what, Jim, have you learned in your efforts of creating diversity, if you have any gems to share, but then also for the group to maybe reflect on how we as a group today have gotten here, because that is significant. Thank you, uh, Ellington. Um, what I'm reminded of, um, that there's a program in Baltimore called the Ingenuity Project. Um, this is a program where all of the students take uh, advanced AP courses. Um, and uh, about six years ago, I was asked to join the board. And I did under one condition dur during the vetting process, I said that, you know, this is a Baltimore program, but it, its demographics do, do not represent the city of Baltimore. Uh, it, it was mostly white. It was mostly white male that were uh, that were in, in the program, and um, um, in an effort to change, there was a lot of concern. Well, if you if you if you make this look a little blacker, this means that the quality Vacations are going to have to be modified and you're going to have to reduce those. We didn't touch the qualifications. The only thing that we did was to ignore letters of reference because we found them very biased. The moral of the story is that the program now is 80% underrepresented minority, which represents the city of Baltimore, but even more importantly, 60% of those are women. And, and the last number that I saw in the, the 2019 class, 100 students raised $10 million in awards and fellowships. There was not a single student that did not have nearly a full ride to most any university that you can think of. Uh, Hopkins is a very difficult university to get in. Seven were offered that year five accepted, two got better offers. The moral of the story, and this, this really surprised me, no one, even I did not think that the program would be as successful as it was opening it up, especially to underrepresented minorities and women, but they have shown that they have the capability of doing the work. This is one of the reasons that your program is going to succeed because you're gonna find students 
that are going to be willing to pursue anything that you put in front of them as learn as long as it's a learning process. So, you know, innovation really is anywhere. It's just what tools you offer to cultivate them and that everyone is capable of being an inventor or an innovator. And you have such a unique story. I mean, to have grown up in Farmville, Virginia, in a one-room school where, you know, oftentimes your, your notebook was a dirt floor. Um, and then you went off to, to go to Temple and then really transform the world. What what's different? I mean, people often ask, how do we duplicate? How do we do this again? And the answer is like, I know you're going to say, well, I don't really see myself as different. And I'm just like, and I love that because that really is the foundation, right? You're just like everyone else, but your trajectory and your success is different, is unique. What do you think that catalyst really is? It's an interesting question. I wish we had talked about this <laughs> But uh, the, uh, um, the, the one thing that I can say is that although we were poor, we had an awful lot of love. And that love came from not just my parents, but my relatives and even those. And, and in fact, I was through the fifth grade before I could call a teacher Mrs. or Mr. was always aunt or uncle, because they, in, sense, in a certain sense, they were maybe not directly related, but related, if you un un understand. They were a part of the family. So I, I think that this had an awful lot to do with, uh, with, um, with uh, the way I turned out. Uh, I also think that the freedom to explore was open to me. Um, uh, that, that is until I got into real trouble by exploring things that I shouldn't. But, uh, but we all have to learn where the boundaries are, especially if they're not established in the beginning. So um, I, from people that I've talked to that come from the same general background and same area of the country, did not have the, the opportunities that I just described that I think had an awful lot to do with the way I turned out. Thank you. Tyrone, I saw your hand. Did you have a question or wanted to open up the floor? I did have a question related to your last question because um, you, you mentioned that, you know, this, this is uh, looking at the screen uh, there's a, you know, it's a beautiful tapestry of people from so many different experiences, um, which, you know, we're really excited about. Um, and I, I was, I wanted to ask Jim, um, to what extent does this moment, right, in history where we're going through this pandemic, we're forced into social isolation, we're forced to basically, in a lot of ways, live our lives through a monitor, right, on, or a screen of some type, how has that sort of help bring more people together from so many different backgrounds. I mean, we're, we're, we're meeting uh, across three different time zones at the very least. And I know of one person who's actually in Canada that has actually joined this meeting, right? It's not even in continental United States. So what role has, you know, do you feel technology in this moment has played? And also once this moment passes, do we go back to the way things were two years ago? Uh, very good question, Tyrone, um, and um, it's one that I've given some thought to, uh, primarily because um, uh, travel is not as comfortable as it once was for me. Uh, but even more importantly, um, how else could I attend a meeting in the morning in California and, and in the evening in New York City without getting on an airplane? I mean, even if I could compress time, it still is not possible uh, to, to do so. Uh, um, now, the, the medium that we're, we're using right now works reasonably well, but it has problems, which is something that acousticians need to pay more closely attention to, to uh, because I think these tools can be 
improved to the degree that uh, that other than those very personal um, uh, uh, attributes that come with personal contact, uh, only those will be missing, not the, some of the ones that we miss uh, now. So um, um, my hope is that we don't fly as much as we used to. My hope is that, uh, that we use the tools that have been created by technology uh, to, um, uh, to involve more people that, that are on the peripheral or on, on, the, on the skirts of technology. Uh, because if the door is open so that there's an even flow, this will also help improve the opportunities for students that you intend to recruit. Great, fantastic. Uh, so Jim, you know, there's this whole notion of IQ, EQ, um, of like weighing your emotional competency, your intellect. And now there's this notion of TQ where we're talking about how your level of kind of technical expertise and, and ability and how we really have to factor that in as we're educating our students so that they're prepared to step into roles and in spaces and become the future members of ASA. And so when you had mentioned um, the Ingenuity Project before, I think that a key component of that also has something to do with mentorship or your own willingness to dedicate so much of your time and your life to the advancement of other specifically underrepresented minorities. What it advice can you lend to us to, to help maintain infrastructures like that or to generate a stronger base and foundation for our students? Excellent question. Um, the, 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 um, you know, the fact that you, you intend to give students a, a research opportunity, an opportunity to see what it's like to be in a lab, to see the, the highs and lows of of uh, what we do, and 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 the both are there beyond a doubt. Um, uh, um, and and my apologies for not having data for this past year, but everybody knows that COVID has upset things, so I don't even bother to quote um, the the numbers uh, now because they're really all over the place. But two years ago, uh, forty three ingenuity students had internships at Bell Lab, I mean, at uh, Johns Hopkins University. Um, and uh, e even to the point that the university provided a bus to transport the students back between the, their school and, and uh, the medical campus uh, where a lot of them had internships. Um, in almost all cases, publications came out of that work. Um, in, all cases, certainly talks came out of that work. But more importantly, these were students who had no surprises when they entered college. They knew what to expect because they had gone through, they, they had had their foot in the door to see what university life was really all about. They had research experiences that told them what life was going to be like for them if they stayed on that course. And, and I must commend the mentors because 80 to 90% of the students who were on those interns are now university students uh, studying STEM. Incredible. So one of the things um, that I had was listening to on a podcast this morning, it was someone who was just saying that, listen, the main motivation in life, like a lot of people who are 90 years old or older who were still alive and kicking it and going strong generally are so committed and so passionate about the work that they do. It's not that they're looking for, capital is not their motivation. It is passion and it is changing the world. And I see two extraordinary 90 year old gentlemen on this call right now, Gerhard Sessler and Jim, who together, right, co-invented the electric microphone. And so 
What I want to know, when we go back to those days in the lab, the two of you from opposite sides of the world, having two very different experiences, yet came together and, and transformed our lives. What drew you two together? What allowed you to continue supporting each other and working together? And now, what, 60 years later, I'm pretty sure that you both just co-published another <laughs> um, article. So, for all of us who I think are striving to continue our careers as long and as respectfully as you both have, what drew you to each other? What keeps you all working together? And what should we be looking for when we're trying to find the right collaborators? That's a real interesting question. Uh, Gerard, do you want to start or should I go ahead? Well, I oh, didn't hear you. Can I, can, I be can I be heard now? Okay. Yes. Um, yeah. Okay. There, there's a book, um, and I wish I could think of the name of it. Uh, perhaps Gerard remembers. It's um, called Click. Click, right. I was, uh, we were interviewed <laughs> separately uh, because Gerard was in Germany when this was done, and I was uh, still in, I uh, was in, in the States. But what was so amazing was that we both felt the same about each other, although we had never discussed it. I had never talked to Gerhard about how I felt about him, nor had he talked about how he felt about me until that was written. So that was the first look at, at, uh, at, at that relationship from a personal standpoint. Now, I, I might also say that there's a, a uh, a third gentleman on, on this call, Vishnu Atal, who um, I'm yes. sure uh, Gerhard will remember and, um, yes. and, and also agree that, um, that we three had a, a, a relationship that transcended not, not just science, but, but the personal part, the, the fact that, that when I wrote the first um, a memo on the summer research program. Gerhard was the one who critiqued it, who, who improved upon it, who read it, who understood the problems that I was trying to, to remedy, although he had no experience in this country other than through me on that problem. Well, I think the uh, important thing is, uh, Jim, that we trust each other. We know that uh, uh, we, we can rely on each other. And uh, it is great, you know, to know that uh, somebody is here that under who understands you uh, with respect to the things you are doing. So um, uh, whenever we got together, you know, uh, it was like a brainstorming session. You know, we, uh, we one word gives the next word. And, uh, and we come up with uh, many new ideas, you know. So I miss this very much that uh, we are now, of course, separated, you know, by an ocean, but <laughs> we still get together once in a while. But it was great, you know, when we worked together uh, many years ago, of course, now. And, uh, but uh, the uh, trust, you know, which we had uh, into each other, you know, at that time continues. And I think that is very important. And I, I'm happy, you know, that we can, these days we can get together more often again. Uh, we had several, uh, of course, uh, opportunities uh, past few days uh, because of our birthdays. And uh, we had this wonderful appreciation of, of me, you know, uh, on my birthday just a few days ago. And I appreciate that, that very much. Thank you very much again. But I'm, we should, just uh, stay together and uh, see each other as often as possible. Yeah. Absolutely. And Vishnu, if you would love to just chime in with a comment, given you being in that exact same space and, and knowing that you were such an essential part of all of the collaboration that happened within those walls, what was your experience like? Oh. I think you might be muted. I can't quite hear you. Unmute, um, um, Vishnu. Vishnu, you're muted. Oh, 
Nope, we can't let hear me, you. Yeah. Yep, check. there okay. we go. Do you hear me now? Yes, yeah. we can. But it's, it's, a, it's a great occasion to see Jim West and Gerhard Sessler. Uh, we are the oldest uh, uh, colleagues uh, today. And uh, when I came from India, uh, I met Jim and he was my roommate at Bell Labs and Gerhard Sessler was next door. Yeah. I want to add one comment here. We are discussing, you know, generally we talk of minorities, underrepresented minorities, but I say diversity is the key to learning. You don't learn in uniform environments. You must have people of diverse background, diverse diversity of many, many kind to make a life much more productive and valuable. And learning is what makes us grow, achieve, and produce value in the society. I fully agree. Thank you for sharing that. And it's amazing to see that it's the three of you, you know, and I think we always learn um, and we should strive to create similar environments that encourage and allow that type of collaboration. Because now it's, you know, three continents that we're discussing that have produced yeah. such incredible life-changing technologies. Mm -hmm. Tyrone, I saw your hand, so please, yes. Yeah, so, so Jim, how has, um, I guess, what has the role of ASA been, right, in, in your career? Um, yeah, simple as that. Yeah, well, when I visited uh, everything from large A ATS meetings to acoustical societies, and even some smaller um, um, uh, organizations uh, that uh, uh, that were of interest because of their direction in terms of charge storage and transport and polymers. Um, but the acoustical society was very different than any of the other societies that I that that I visited. It was far more friendly. It was far more open, and and they provided what I was there for a discussion uh, to talk about what I was doing. I wanted to learn from them what they were doing, and the acoustical society gave me that opportunity, and it is one of the major reasons that it became my home, um, uh, be, because it was far more personal. And, and I always felt that it had my best interest in, in, in mind and gave me the advice that I needed to succeed. Can I ask a question in response to something that Jim said earlier? Yes, please. So Jim, you mentioned that you and Gerard had similar thoughts about each other without ever having having spoken to each other about them. I'm curious to know if both you and Gerard could give some examples of what you mean by that, or what you meant by that. Um, I, I think Gerard said uh, the, the main one was uh, trust. Uh, the second was that, um, that I, I had a great appreciation for the differences and the similarities between our lives. Um, Gerhard took his father's violin apart to find out where the sound was. I took my grandfather's watch apart to find out why it kept time. And so we both had the experience of, 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 um, of curiosity getting us into, in, into trouble. So uh, we both were, have always been ver very curious and uh, the the second part, and and I think that uh, that um, uh, this was true also with with Vishnu. Whenever we got together, we always found a problem that we could zero in on and try to make some headway. And it didn't always have to be science. It could have, in many cases, have been. Um, um, uh, uh, 
society problems, so social problems, we also talked a lot about. But um, I think that those are the main points that, uh, that we felt for each other but never expressed. Very nice. Thanks for sharing. I see that we have a question from Carrie. Yeah, I had a question for Gerhard and Vishniji. I was wondering, um, moving to the U.S., what was the hardest obstacle to integrating into ASA or the acoustical community at the time? And do you think that's still the same or is it different? And if it's different, um, what's the most difficult one now? Oh, Gerhard, I can't hear you. I don't think. I, yes, uh, my yep. microphone is on. You're perfect yeah. now. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, uh, I didn't quite understand the question, you know, what was uh, concerned the acoustical society? Uh, uh, in the acoustical society, I think. Oh, uh, sorry, Gerhard, you're fading out again. Yeah, I think yeah. you're not speaking into the microphone or close to the microphone. A little, it's still cutting out. I'm not sure if it's the internet connection or where you, the microphone is. It's the fact that he's in Germany. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm far away. I realized that, but uh, once in a while, the uh, uh, understandability is very good, you know, but uh, now, right now, there seems to be a slight problem somewhere. It's good. It's Can you understand now. me better now? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, yeah. Okay. okay, well, again, the question that was asked, uh, you know, uh, concerned the acoustical society, but uh, I didn't quite understand what uh, the, the uh, what was the uh, question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, Carrie, can you repeat your question? Yeah, I was just curious um, what the, the hardest hurdle was for feeling like you were part of the network or the community of ASA, um, since this is an American society, and if that hurdle is the same now, you think, or if it's changed over time? <clears throat> well, that's, of course, uh, I feel very much at home in the acoustic society, perhaps uh, I also got uh, some rewards, rewards from them. You know, uh, I ended the meetings probably as long as you did, Jim, I think, in 1960 or so. Of course, I'm not attending so many meetings these days because it's just too complicated to, uh, to attend, you know, to come to the state. Um, you know, it costs a lot of money and uh, you know, of course, you do most of the things by Zoom, but uh, not a few years ago, you know, you had to go to the meeting. There was no transmission of the meetings as it is uh, now over the past year. Oh, <clears throat> but uh, whenever I went to the society, and I came there even from Germany uh, many times over the years, uh, I felt very much at home. I knew quite some people there. Jim was, of course, and, and Vishnu were mostly there also, and uh, I, it was nice to meet those guys again, uh, but uh, there were also many other people whom I knew, so I felt at home in that society. Of course, there are other societies here in Germany where I feel at home. We have a German acoustical society. I attend the meetings, and uh, it's not as large as the ASI, uh, but it's also uh, nice to uh, attend these meetings, but uh, the uh, most important meetings I attended, you know, were at the Acoustical Society of America. Thank you, Gerhard. And, and Vishnu, how, how did you feel? It Was it a welcoming space? I'm assuming yes, but we'd love to hear from, from you. Is it how just the experience was and, and, and if it's changed um, over time with with more non-Americans becoming involved. I don't, I don't know the breakdown and the representation that we have and, and how those numbers really have improved over time, but I'm curious to know if the sentiment or the experience has changed in, an, in a way that you've observed. I came from India 
This was in May 1961. I didn't study here. Manfred Schroeder, who was one of the persons in this group, uh, apart from Jim West and Sessler, um, he discovered me and he called me on phone and offered a job. So you can see the welcome uh, it, it, for a person in America to offer a job to a person in India was not like now. India and America were as far away as maybe the moon and the earth. Um, they didn't know anything about India and to trust that a person in Bangalore will be able to work at Bell Labs was a, a, a kind of step of tremendous courage and faith in human beings. I didn't study at American University, I studied Indian universities. And when I came here, it was a different place. I never have thought of anything like America sitting in India. I studied in Bangalore and Lucknow, this North India. Those are very different places. And it was a big step for me to come here. But again, I want to thank, uh, it's amazing how, what human beings have in common. My wife and I came on with two suitcases, know nothing about America, didn't know what to eat here because we were vegetarians and vegetarian food was not available. We didn't know where to live, but the Bell Lab people, several of them, uh, Edward David is one of them who was my director uh, and Manfred Schroeder and many others, all these college people really went out of their way to make me part of America. I didn't know what to buy, what to wear, what to eat, where to go, what to do. Everything I learned from uh, people at Bell Labs. And they were, I just don't want to use the word generous. The gen this is a limit of generosity. It's only thing which connected was with all human beings. And that is a very strong link we forget. And uh, I, I compare sometimes the environment I came in in 61 with what is happening here. Everybody is fighting each other these days in India and America. But we didn't do that in those days. And we were very different and I miss those times. Uh, Manfred Schroeder and his uh, 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 wife uh, used to take me to beaches at, uh, in New Jersey because I've never to been to a beach. I learned a lot of things from them. And then Jim West came to my house, uh, apartment one day and introduced um, um, uh, his friends. And of course, we, I used to spend a lot of time with Jim because he was my roommate. And I learned a lot of things from him. And slowly we grew up. Uh, and uh, Bell Lab, of course, was an extraordinary organization. Nothing like that. Uh, we worked for at and but we didn't understand what it meant. We thought we worked, I don't know for whom. I did get my salary all right, but we worked. But worked in ways uh, which can't be duplicated today. We didn't work for the company. The, and it's simply I find amazing uh, how things went. And our vice president of research was Mr. Bill Baker. Now, he was instrumental in getting me to America because I got the job, but I didn't have the visa. The, the problem of getting a visa for Indians was impossible because America was a country where immigration laws 
were tilted toward Europeans. Europeans could immigrate, but not Indians. So uh, the immigration people told me the life, the waiting time is infinite <laughs> for getting a visa. So Mr. Bill Baker went out of his way to call Secretary McNamara because Mr. Bill Baker was the advisor, not only the vice president of research, he's advisor to defense secretary, Mr. McNamara, and he was the advisor to President Kennedy. So he called Mr. McNamara and said, you know, you are causing a lot of delays in not providing a visa. Uh, can you please call Secretary Dean Rusk and ask him to expedite it so that I could come here. And the day the call was made, uh, Bell Lab informed me that we are trying to do something. Within a month, I got a letter from American Embassy in, in Delhi. You can pick up your visa anytime you like. So I cannot discover this kind of harmony between people. We, I didn't know Bell Lab. I didn't know Mr. Baker. I didn't know Mr. <laughs> I didn't know anybody. I was coming from a small place in India and suddenly we created a community which was so strong and so get. So Mr. Baker and I were became almost friends. Last time I talked to him was he was 86. I had a one hour conversation with him about many things. And then we have very great people. John Pierce, your satellite communication was invented by him. I had a three hour talk with him. We used to be in what's called building 15 at Bell Labs. Mr. Pierce walked into my office because he visited some other people who were working with fish. Uh, we used to call them fish people at building 15. And I had a three hour talk with Mr. Pierce. Completely unknown person. Mr. Pierce was way high up in organization and I was just a little guy but we were talking. I wish we could bring everybody together the same way again. Let us talk to each other. Let us help each other. Let us part be of each other because we are all human beings and we learn from each other. We support each other. We make our life better for each other and we enrich everything. But I'm sorry to say, <laughs> what is, I don't know what's happening. People are fighting and fighting and fighting. But I think that you captured the essence of what made Bell Labs so special and why there was probably the most remarkable technology that we can be proud of came out of that space and, and came through the power of collaboration. And so now that I have a small startup and I'm working to create the same type of environment, and I know that everyone on this call is, is looking for the best ways to recreate or at least recreate a fraction of the magic that happened there. Can you help or leave us all with a piece of advice that you might have of how or what we can do to best bring that spirit back into the space of collaboration and tech and acoustics specifically? I will add one, one more thought here. So what are we as human beings? Of course, I call myself now a protein machine. I'm a gene machine, but protein, I made a protein. And I have a silicon machine uh, right in front of me. But how do these machines work? What makes these protein machines work? I am completely amazed that I never realized that, but more I learn about these things now, that it's, it's a, a, a chain of proteins can be so productive. And my life runs on the basis of proteins. And that's how everything happens. Now, we are all should think that as human beings, what are we? We are always trying to put, I don't know whether the right word to say, too much material world. But 
and the central part of our body is our brain and thank god i have a brain because god this is a god given gift a brain which allowed allows me to learn new things and i start from nothing uh, and just by learning i grow up uh, in fact we used to jim and uh, gerard sessler and manfred schroeder all of us were working in room acoustics uh, i did not work in the area of uh, speech at all in india because i knew nothing about it now later on i shifted to speech and your cell phone uh, is my uh, you know each time as someone uses this cell phone i feel so happy because there are 2 billion of people using cell phones now and i feel happy because they use cell phone i don't use much of cell phone i do use but not as much as others so each time i think of all these billions of people using a cell phone amount of happiness i get i cannot describe it how happy i am every day of my life at this advanced age of 88 that people use cell phone and why i worked on cell phone that's a bell lab story i call my mr schroder when he talked to me to offer the job he talked for 1 hour but he got only 1 minute of his speech uh, is uh, gerard sessler talking now had difficulty but manfred schroder coming from bell labs had a great difficulty talking to me we talked for about a minute at the most connection was very poor we heard the operators calling each other hello pune hello london hello new york but no thing then i called my mother after coming here i want to tell her i am here safe well i talked to her 3 minutes the charge was 20 dollars 20 dollars of those days is like 200 dollars of today in purchasing power out of 3 minutes call I got only one or two lines of communication, so I called AT and T and said, "This is unfair. You know, that I can't even talk to my mother, and you put me and send me a bill of twenty dollars. This twenty dollar bill uh, will not carry me further because if I call to mother, mother a few times, it will simply <laughs> take most of my salary away." Well, AT and T's at that time said that not Bell Labs, AT and T's long lines department, which the telephone department said that's how things are. Then I said, why should you charge twenty dollar for nothing? Because I could not talk. They say we have to make money. I got so mad at AT and T, not at Bell Labs. <laughs> I got so much mad at Bell AT and T. I said things have to change, and. as soon as we finished working in acoustics in philharmonic hall in new york city i switched to this problem that how to make a telephone call to india cheap well this was 1963 or so and it took me 20 years to create a device which could work like so that people can talk at a low cost we, cell phone were not in use those days we had landlines people used to walk to an office and sit in a chair and talk we didn't have cell phones but ultimately six, uh, things started working out and cell phones came into our lives in a big way but really big when they came when steep jobs Put a iPhone in the market for six hundred dollars, but it, it was so gratifying. My friends in eighty uh, three at at lunch table told me that what you are doing is useless because eighty three was the year AT and T was divided up into many many pieces, and everybody thought that. Bell Lab is not doing good work. They do some science, but nothing useful. And hence, uh, what you are doing is a typical example of wasting time, because the 
thing what you call I didn't call cell phone, but this 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 uh, work I did, which become became a cell phone, took. You know, you could not do this research on uh, on anything because to to simulate the cell phone required such enormous resources. So uh, I use a, a supercomputer called Cray computer, where the time for one second of computing was charged at a very high rate. So every second of a speech I processed on that computer, sent a bill to AT&T for $52. And my boss, Mr. Flanagan, after a month told me, he said, you have exhausted the whole computing budget of the uh, my whole department. Um, so I said, what should I do? Should I stop? Well, he said, no, 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 don't do that. Well, he went to his boss and he went to his boss. Ultimately, our chief boss was Mr. Penzias, who won the Nobel Prize for the uh, Big Bang thing. And he said, how much will it cost? Uh, well, $5 million. Well, Penzia said, okay. Bell Lab bought a, a computer to justify all that. They said other people can also use it. And I started using and computing for free. And that's how do I research. So when I talked to my friend at lunch table, he said, you are doing something which will take $52 for one second of a speech. Now, if you build this device, how much will how, how will it be? I say it will be as big as Washington Monument. <laughs> and it will cost a billion dollars. He said, you see, I told you, you are wasting your time and wasting the resources of Bell Lab because you are the source of trouble for Bell Labs. That's how Bell Lab at and was divided because you wasted your whole life doing nothing. Well, what can I say? I smiled because I also knew the cost of building integrated circuits the, 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 uh, on a chip was going down at 30% every year. That is, in one year, it went down fairly big amount. In 10 years, it will go by 100 times. So I said 20 years, it will be 10,000 times. In 30 years, it will be a million times. So if it cost something as big as uh, Washington Monument, well, the cost of the components would have been a billion dollars. So I divided billion times by a million, and I got a thousand dollars. I said, uh, thousand is not too bad. Mr. Steve Jobs did produce a phone which cost $600 and did everything I did. And we are all using it. I, it's called iPhone. We like those pictures there. We press buttons. Uh, there was a phone uh, made by, I forget now, LG or something, which had buttons. And I didn't like these uh, keys and all this of telephone. But this uh, iPhone change life of everybody. And today, in India, even the beggar, the person who has no money and no food to eat has an iPhone. That's the most important thing everybody has because iPhone connects everybody. So that's another central story. We human beings should get connected. And today we are disconnected, so we fight. We should Connection comes because our brain connects your brain in ways I don't understand. Our thought processes kind of start, I don't have the right word for it now at this moment. And that's sure. how we grow up together. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Can you hear me? Can you understand me? Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, we discussed, you know, how uh, poor communications was in those days, you know, when we came to Bell Labs. And we also discussed how well your personal, personal communication was. 
communication uh, between you and uh, Ed David or Manfred Schroeder, you know, that was great. But the uh, communication, uh, communications over long distances was very poor. Now, my question is, today we have very good connections. Thank to you, thanks to your work, Vishnu, uh, as far as telecommunications is concerned. You know, we can call to India or to any country. We can call uh, from the States to Germany. And usually with our iPhones, we can do that. Uh, uh, everything works very well. But how is it now these days on the personal level, say at the labs? Do we, do we still have these collaborations, you know, these personal chaos that we had when you came, Vishnu, to, from India to the United States and you got all the help from Manfred, from Jim West, from, uh, from uh, Baker, you know, all the way up they helped you. Is it still this way? If somebody comes to Bell Labs these days, does he still get the care and the help that you, Vishnu, and I also, of course, when I came to Bell Labs, received at that time? That's my question. Can you, of course, uh, we need somebody who knows how Bell Labs works these days. I'm not so sure. I have not been there for a long time. Perhaps Jim knows more about this. Jim, you probably still have visited Bell Labs uh, in recent times, and do you have the uh, impression that uh, the uh, personal communications on the uh, very close uh, connections, you know, between people who work in the same room, for instance, is it still as good as it was in our time? My impression is that it is not, um, and it's not for a number of reasons. Um, during our tenure at Bell Labs, there were at least a thousand plus principal investigators. Uh, Bell Labs now, the last time I looked had about a hundred and they were all specializing in, in radio. Uh, in other words, it was not a diverse core group of people in many uh, different disciplines and what and, and when you have this distribution of, of, of um, scientists in, in many different areas, um, I, I, I know both of you remember saying, being told you cannot close your door. Anybody who comes and knocks on your door, maybe from chemistry, maybe from math, maybe from materials or some other department, you still welcome that person because you never know when you will want information from them. And in, in just looking for materials that had deep traps to trap um, electrons, we depended an awful lot on the chemistry department. I remember Lee Blyler, for example, and there are a couple of other people that we collaborated with that helped us uh, with that problem. Now, you can only do that when you have a diverse workforce. And, and that does not exist at Bell Labs anymore. Uh, but I, I have another story that, um, that hinges on um, Vishnu's um, uh, uh, spending great amount of dollars for computers. Uh, when we were reasonably certain that the electric microphone was stable over time, uh, Jim Flanagan made a tremendous push to get that in the telephone. Sony had already made the first commercial microphone, I think, in 1968. Uh, and um, uh, Jim Flanagan proposed that electrets should be looked at to replace the carbon microphone. Well, there was a memo that was written that said, that the cost of the carbon microphone was down to 53 cents a piece. And there would be no microphone ever made that could beat that price, uh -huh. in spite of the fact that it required 100 milliamps of current. Well, you know the moral to that story is that you can buy electric microphones with pets for 10 cents a piece today. So um, these crystal balls did not tell the truth. Uh, uh, and uh, I, but I think that 
many stories from Bell Labs can come to the same conclusion. We pushed the envelope of technology, but there was always pushback from the development side in terms of, of the speed with which these new technologies would get integrated into the system. Yeah, that was my experience too, you know, that uh, the development people were really holding up the whole thing, you know, they, we came with uh, new ideas that uh, could be implemented uh, and we suggested it to them, but I did, did not listen. They were not interested in this. That was, uh, that was uh, very bad. Uh, and uh, this is against what we said before, you know, in the sense that we had very good collaboration within our departments, you know, uh, that uh, the uh, things work very well there, but uh, not uh, the relation between research and development it was not as good as it could have been, at least as far as our work was concerned. Great. But again, Thanks. I don't know how it is these days. Challenging. It, it is yeah. challenging, not only in the shell of what was Bell Labs, but I think externally, as we all work to navigate and duplicating that, we're all aware of, of, of how heavy that lift is. Because while we can yeah. have intersections from different um, disciplines, we still yes. lack the ability to call upstairs and say, and we need enough funding that will fund something to be the size of the equivalent of the Washington Monument. Like there's just these limitations that we have to figure out <laughs> incredible ways to navigate, but I'm here to raise the fund. So if anyone wants to get involved, just let me know. But I'm gonna um, pass the ball over to Drew Grant, which is so phenomenal because this is just an extension of the legacy of Bell Labs in that he is a student at Hopkins um, in Jim's lab. So Drew. Yeah, so I had a question. Um, and my question is about just the progression towards diversifying STEM. And I wanted to know Dr. West um, and anybody else, um, what are the next steps to progress the push to diversify in STEM and acoustics? Oh, well, I think Tyrone would be better to answer that than me because he's working on that problem right now. Um, let me um, uh, first, uh, uh, Drew is a uh, third year uh, graduate student in my group. Um, uh, among other things, he has um, found that he can detect um, COVID-19 by evaluating um, uh, speech. Um, the, and, and this even holds for false positives. So I just wanted to give a shout out for the work that, uh, that he's doing. I think um, you have an abstract into ASA on that, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and to uh, answer your question, uh, I think we all owe it upon ourselves to reach back and find someone to pull them through the loop. I always am proud of the way that you described the call that I put out to you. Um, and and there, there's a long lineage uh, here because um, Drew's uh, advisor at Morgan was a corporate research fellow which was one of the programs that we started at Bell Labs. He got his PhD through that uh, program. And so I had a connection and what, what we need to do is to, to keep these connections, to strengthen them. And, and uh, you, Drew, definitely have the responsibility of reaching back to your undergraduate institution to make sure that they are aware of the program that Tyrone is, is um, organizing because uh, HBCUs are a good source of, of uh, students uh, for the program. My, my one comment on this, and, uh, and then I have, to, I have to actually sign off and I think this will be the last question uh, for this conversation, is um, we have to rethink STEM education 
in particular, the whole notion and idea, and I've had some conversations with members of like AIP and other uh, member societies within AIP, of the whole notion of um, gatekeeper courses. Mm -hmm. It creates this very toxic, this very um, oppressive, competitive environment. And AAAS actually had a webinar series on this. There's been studies on this. It actually tends to disproportionately drive more students of color and women as well out of STEM. Um, they, they actually did the study where they looked at what was the rate at which women, students of color, Hispanic, Black were selecting STEM majors. And basically it came out to be comparable to white students but they were leaving STEM at a much higher rate. And they were leaving STEM within the first two years of their majors and switching over to, they weren't leaving college. They all weren't leaving college. Many of them were just switching to other majors. There's also the question of finance, how to, how to afford college nowadays. But the gatekeeper, course, gatekeeper courses are a huge problem. And, and, and until we change that, um, we need to just increase the number of students actually get through the whole process. I mean, they're, they're majoring, they're signing up, they're, they're going to college, they're not finishing. That alone would be, would, would have a huge impact on the number of people that are pursuing careers in STEM or graduate degrees in STEM. That alone. Seems like such a small thing and yet universities, because of, I've mentioned this on Twitter, um, tradition is hand tying people. It's a tradition to have these gatekeeper courses. Who said that? Who made that rule? Wasn't me. Wasn't you. Yeah, everybody, I'm going to have to sign off because I've got to give a lecture in about 15 minutes and I'm not ready for it yet. But it was great talking to all of you uh, and Vishnu and Girat and others. Uh, it's good to see you again. Um, and um, be safe, stay away from COVID-19, and get your vaccines. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Well, thank, thanks so much, everybody, for your uh, uh, attendance. And Ellington, thanks for doing such an exceptional job moderating this conversation. It was it really, was really joy. exceptional. Thank you for um, including me. And I'm looking forward to our next, this sets a bar for the next open meeting. <laughs> Let me tell you, such mm -hmm. a high bar. We're looking forward to the next time we all gather. And everybody stay safe and take care.